Oh, you guys, seriously. Um, I, um, I have to start again. <laughs> welcome. Uh, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. It is Tuesday, March 8th, uh, 2022. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to be with us. It's so funny about the sound because I actually thought to myself, I need to turn the mic on when I turn the camera on because I will forget. And sure enough, um, it's almost like it's just kind of one of those things that it's just, I've got this mental block about turning on the microphone. Uh, it's because the battery dies really quickly. That's why. So I'm constantly making sure that the battery is there and everything is ready to go. So you guys are already full in the chat. You guys are already off to the races and leaving me behind in terms of um, what you guys are, are chatting about and um, getting started with. I have a few, a little pile here of things that I want to share with you today. I've got my, it's on this side, my Lunenberg to share a little bit with you about. I actually, honestly, I thought I would have it done by today. I really, really, truly thought that it would be done. When I shared you guys um, with about it last week, I really honestly thought that I would be done. I, I don't tend to get stuck on sleeves particularly, but there just was no time to work on it this week and uh, I really didn't get a whole lot done. So um, has anybody else been feeling a little bit blah? the last couple weeks. Um, I'm sure it has to do with the global situation. I am sure that it is just general fatigue. Um, I think it's the time of year. We're finally getting some nicer weather, some sun, but uh, I've definitely felt a bit flat and not super excited about working on things and not feeling a lot of creative mojo. However, I have been able to get a couple of things done um, that I'm excited about and that I'm looking forward to. So that's been really positive. Uh, Becca says black here, here as well. Amanda said definitely blah here. Kathy says, yep. <laughs> I really appreciate that you guys get it. Um, Julie says, yes, me too. Just staring into the distance. Yes. So last night, uh, Mike took, uh, Nora with him to James's soccer practice. I actually had a headache and um, it's the changing of the seasons. I always get tension headaches and from winter to spring is definitely my worst. And uh, I just kind of was feeling a bit under the weather, really, really tired, had a couple of not so great night sleeps. And he said, I'll take the kids, I'll take Nora, we'll play soccer while James is playing, it'll be great. Uh, it was a lovely evening. And I, I ended up going in the hot tub and uh, I just kind of sat there and stared. Like I figured I would read, I took my book with me and I ended up just kind of sitting there staring into the distance. So Julie, you and me both. Dagmar says she feels kind of energyless. Um, yeah, I have lo lost like all my mojo, says Rebecca. Elizabeth says she's exhausted. Um, I know Rebecca, one of her things that she does when she's feeling a bit stressed and overwhelmed and stuff is she starts making spreadsheets. So she's been making spreadsheets. Um, Sam says very blah right now. Um, honestly, didn't occur to me that it was because of the global situation, says Rebecca. You know, I, I feel like how could it not? You know, like how could how could we not be affected? Um, we all we all are in this together. So I. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. For those um, who are uh, new to the community and are, are just getting started with the community, welcome. I hope that you guys are uh, um, uh, feel welcome here and that you uh, know that you are welcome here. To those who are returning viewers, thank you so much for continuing to watch the show week in, week out. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind to take a moment to like and subscribe, I really appreciate that. And uh, to those who are uh, part of the Patreon community, you guys are the ones that keep the lights on week after week. And I just wanna say an extra special thank you, a heartfelt thank you for being here and for supporting the work that I do because I really appreciate you guys. And I wouldn't be able to do this if, if it wasn't for your support. So thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, Pam says just a lot of, a lot of sadness. Uh, Brittany says it's gorgeous and sunny here in the Yukon up to plus two degrees Celsius this morning for up from, uh, 20 minus 20 this morning. That's really nice. Um, Eve says, yep, struggling to, to sleep some nights. 
So I wanted to mention before we run the credits, uh, Twisting Tales Magazine discount code for those who are wishing to subscribe is Rachel-10, all in capital letters. That is valid until March 22nd, so please don't forget to use that. Um, they have very kindly offered that to us for basically a whole month. And uh, the review was in last episode, so if you're interested in learning more, go to episode 236. And I think that's it for like major, major um, housekeeping for me for today. Um, and uh, I think what I've got to share with you is sort of some works in progress, some things that I've been thinking about. I want to talk about my X's and O's coasters because they are done. They are pressed. So they're like done, done, done. They haven't been photographed. Um, I'll show you, show you some the yarn that I used to make them and uh, I am planning another set so that's why this yarn is here. And then I've been spinning some Angora. So Angora was what we covered this morning in the wool circle. And uh, I'll chat with you a little bit about that and about that beautiful downy fiber. And, uh, and then we'll call it a day. I've got some community participation, some incredibly inspiring things to share with you guys. And uh, that'll be a wrap for this week. So the show always goes so fast. I don't know. I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but honestly, it just goes like that for me. So I, uh, I hope you enjoy the show and I'll see you on the other side. So I thought I would start off with uh, my, um, why don't we start off with the Lunenberg. It's in behind me and I can share it with you. Um, there's not a whole lot to say about this because to be honest with you, it's, um, um, well, it's still a work in progress and I've talked about it quite a bit on the show. So I am using some, um, I'm going to put the words commercial in quotes. It's not really commercial yarn. It is basically homespun. Uh, it is a milled yarn from a uh, local to Kelly mill. Kelly is in the Slack channel is at Kelly and this is her yarn, uh, Dominion Fleece and Fiber, 100% grown and processed in Alberta. Um, it is no North Country Cheviot, two ply sport weight. It's approximately 180 yards and uh, I am knitting it. The, the dark blue is the indigo, uh, is the marigold over dyed with indigo. So that's this gorgeous dark color here sort of like a tealy green. It's very, very dark. I love it. Um, it is um, coming off on my hands quite a bit, so I'm a little bit concerned about what's going to happen when I go to wash it, but we will cross that bridge when I come to it. I might actually just use color catchers. The I had five skeins of the indigo and marigold, and then I had a skein of the green, a skein of the orange, and a skein of the undyed. So there was the uh, three sort of contrast colors. And then I added in this natural tawny brown that's here that's a Shetland, no, sorry, it's a Suffolk, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, uh, Shetland alpaca blend. And so that is that sort of tawny brown that's in there that's through the color work as well. And this is uh, a really, really neat yoke for the Lunenberg. This is, um, uh, it's it's not really mosaic knitting. It's more like the Bohas, is that how you say it? Uh, knitting tradition where you've got pearl ridges uh, going through your color work. Really, really fun to do. Creates a lot of texture, creates a really fun um, pattern. And then I've already knit the body twice. So this is the second body. Um, originally, you guys might remember us talking about this in the early fall, late summer. Um, the pattern says to cast on stitches underneath and then to underneath your arm and then to continue knitting. So you, it's a top down cardigan, uh, cardigan, top down sweater. Start at your collar, work your way down, separate for your sleeves and your body, and then you continue knitting. You're basically doing three tubes. And when you separate your sleeves from your body, you cast on stitches underneath. And to be honest with you, it was just too big. It added like three inches of positive ease 
on both sides. So for a total of six inches of positive ease. And as you can see, if I turn this around to the back of the sweater, it already has gaping amounts of positive ease. Um, the smallest size for this pattern, I think is a 39 inch bust. I feel like that's the smallest size. I did cast on for that size, uh, knowing that I would end up with about nine to 10 inches of positive ease. My upper bust measurement is about 31, 30, 31. My full bust measurement is a 33 inch, 34 inch. Um, to, to be honest with you, it depends on the under underwear, like what, what you're wearing, like which bra, which, whether you're wearing a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, you know, not a sweatshirt, but a long sleeve shirt and a tank top like I've got on today. It just depends on, on that positive ease because the, the, the measurement of your body is not just um, your body naked. It's also what you're putting on your body under that sweater or under that garment. So you need to take into account that, you know, your butt, your full bust measurement might be 34 inches, but let's say you put on a bra with padding. Uh, let's say you put on a, a, an undershirt and then a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt. Like what do you normally wear? Do you know what I mean? Um, that can up your bust measurement to closer to 35 or maybe even 36, depending on what you like to wear. So, um, when I say that my, when I give a range for my measurements, it's because it's taking into account clothing. So just stuff to think about. Um, so this is already quite, quite a lot of positive ease. Um, I have talked about this before. I do not look awesome with a ton of positive ease. It's just the shape of my body. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's because I'm an hourglass, etc., etc. I need a waist, blah, 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 blah. So, um, there is no waste in this. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to, uh, well, I've got two ideas. One was to separate the hems. So on the sides here was to separate it and do a split hem. And then the other, th so that I could tuck in the front of the sweater into high-waisted jeans and kind of create the illusion of a middle. Uh, or I'll just knit it in the round and have a, a nice, sort of a slightly boxy sweater um, that would look really nice with with skinny jeans underneath. So you've got sort of that slightly, slightly boxier top and then you've got the curvature of skinny jeans on, on the bottom. So whichever one, however it works out. Um, I have started the ribbing on the cuff here. Um, the sleeves are gonna be a little bit shorter than I normally would like and that's just because of yarn, um, the amount of yarn that I have and I can always uh, block it out, you know, where I kind of stretch them a little bit. And then I'm about halfway through this sleeve. So I'm, get, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Does anybody have any questions about this before I continue? The teal, the dark teal is pretty amazing and shout color catches are legit <laughs> white men. <laughs> um, the shout color catches are legit witchcraft. I love it. So that's actually what I have is the, is the shout um, color catcher. So it's really good to know, Zan. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to Amanda. This is her first live stream. So it's so good to see you. Um, Oh, thank you, Jenny. She didn't want to miss out on the live stream because of the X's and O's coasters. We're definitely going to talk about those. And um, um, yes, workshop tip from Patty Lyons. Give priority to the upper bust measurement, not the actual bust. So Amy Herzog says that as well. I'm just moving my hair out of the way so I can show you guys what an upper bust measurement is versus a full bust. So the full bust is down here, basically at the nipple line, and your upper bust is this measurement up here. It can be a little bit difficult to get an accurate upper bust measurement because when you're pulling on it, there is a tendency to kind of pull it a bit taut. Um, from your underarms because remember you've got ligaments and whatnot sitting there as you as your arms wing out right so uh, just be aware that it can be difficult to get that measurement and to get an accurate measurement so you may want your somebody who you're um, who you trust to help you with that so uh, yeah <laughs> we always get into weird and wonderful conversations I always wonder like if somebody doesn't know what we're talking about they would be like wow they they talk about very odd things um, so, and I would love to hear actually from, from those who have sort of found that these measurements have changed over time, how the fit of their sweaters that they've already made work. Um, because, uh, you know, it's funny, we got into a conversation last show about, um, you know, knitting for your body, where you're at and body love and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and it doesn't mean we're not trying to live healthfully and do all of that kind of stuff, but you know, we sort of uh, went down that rabbit hole. Uh, and I do wonder, so for me, um, as my body has shifted and changed uh, pre and post children, I have found that my sweaters, it doesn't really matter if I'm 10 pounds lighter or 10 pounds heavier or right smack in the middle, it doesn't really seem to matter. The sweaters pretty much fit the same. Um, they might be a wee bit tighter or a wee bit snugger, but like as a general rule, this, there's just not that much difference. And I think it's a testimony to how uh, flexible sweaters can be, um, knit garments can be. There's a lot of give to them. Um, especially with pullovers, you can wear them, you know, sort of at any uh, stage and, and that few inches of positive ease or that few inches of, of possible negative ease in certain places isn't really that big of a deal until you get into big size discrepancies. So I would love to hear more from anybody who's had that experience where, um, you know, at, at whatever um, end of the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to read your comment out loud, um, Eve, but that is very funny about not needing padding, padded bras anymore. All right. Okay. <laughs> so Dorothy, I'm sorry to like just randomly laugh. Um, Dorothy says, it's not really that you haven't finished the sweater. It's that you haven't finished it twice. <laughs> You haven't finished it twice yet. <laughs> it makes me laugh. I always run into trouble with too tight sweaters if I use the upper bust measurement. And actually, uh, Sarah, you bring up a really good point. If your butt, if your upper bust measurement and your full bust measurement, if there's a big discrepancy between the two, you definitely need to take that into account because um, I have found in the past, even though I'm not very big busted, I have found in the past that if I have a, a sweater that buttons up, um, if your full bust, if you have a, a zero or negative ease for that sweater for your button, in, what in, what, what invariably happens is you've got your button here and then you've got your button here and you've got a, you know, a bulging hole. Um, so short of putting a, a crap ton of buttons on, which isn't always the answer either, uh, you, you definitely want a, a sweater that, that you know, has that appropriate amount of ease across the bust that it's going to fit. Um, if you knit a sweater that's, let's say, you know, 40 inches in your upper bust, because that's your measurement, but your full bust is a 52, that's a big discrepancy in terms of what will work for ease. And uh, so I think in some ways, some of these upper bust, low, you know, full bust measurements and whatnot, you do kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and know your body and what fits your body. If you're going to go with your upper bust measurement, you need to somehow get bust darts in there or some added, um, some added, um, uh, fitting techniques to compensate for that difference in size. And some people it's not even, it's the opposite. Um, I remember there was a conversation on one of the live streams probably a few years ago where somebody was mentioning that their shoulders are quite a bit bigger than their bust. And so they've kind of got like the opposite issue where unless they downsize as they move downward um, in if they're doing a top down sweater, if they don't take stitches out and diminish the size once they separate for the body and the sleeves, they end up sort of with this bag that fits over top of them. Does that make sense? So you definitely need to know your, your body. All right. And I'm always happy to help if people are struggling with some of this stuff and they're struggling with the math and whatnot, just, just get in touch. Cause I, I know it can be really overwhelming and uh, you know, we can sort of work through that together. Um, all right. I don't remember my upper bust measurement, but to give you an idea, I'm working with an eight inch difference, absolutely, between my full bust and my under bust. Yes, yes. So it's not your under bust, it's your upper bust. That's that's the difference. Um, and actually, your waist measurement, which is of course under your bust, um, you want there you that. Uh, you want that measurement um, in your finished garments to have positive ease. So the general rule of thumb is two inches of positive ease for your upper bust, a uh, snug fit for your full bust, and then two inches of positive ease around your waist. And the reason for positive ease around your waist and around this middle section is because it gives the illusion of being um, an hourglass, even if you're not. Um, and it gives the illusion of 
um, that there's nothing there because the sweater's got that positive ease and it gives the illusion of, of that very slim um, hourglass. So we could talk about this all day because I really enjoy talking about this stuff, but we need to move, move on. <laughs> So if you guys have any other questions, don't hesitate to pop them in the chat and we'll address them in a little bit. So let's move to our, uh, this screen. I'm just going to adjust the camera a little bit because it's a little bit zoomed in and I think we could probably stand for it being a little bit more, uh, not quite so large. Uh, this morning, I so I have all of these bobbins sitting around. This is mulberry silk. I have the Tofino road trip, I have Tessa silk, I've got uh, some of the, uh, my advent calendar from Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks. Uh, what else do I have? I've got uh, silk that needs to be, silk mawatas that need to be um, plied. I have probably a dozen bobbins <laughs> that need to be plied and that is so not like me. Anybody who's followed for a while, you guys know that is not like me. So I need to get all of this stuff plied. So I'm hoping that by next week I'll have I'll have some stuff to show you guys that's that's plied. And then this morning we were spinning Angora. I'm doing a two ply, um, very fine, to uh, for the uh, Sweet Georgie Yarns luxury workshop that's coming up in the spring. It'll probably be released sometime in the summer. And uh, this is the first bobbin. And you may be wondering where these bobbins came from and what they are. They're just little itty bitty bobbins. These are from the very fast flyer on the Lendrum double treadle DT wheel. So this is another um, plying head, that, or, sorry, flyer head that you can get. And um, this is uh, um, the Angora. So um, we've got 20 grams of the Angora to spin. These are all the samples from this morning that I photographed and popped into the wool circle uh, post and the channel on Slack, on Slack. It's the wool stream, hashtag the wool stream. So, um, yeah, you guys can have a look at that. I've got this right here under my thumb is the is the second bobbin to spin. And then this stuff over here will be saved for the spinning in the workshop to actually do it at the wheel and film it and do all of that. Yeah, I did. So this morning during virtual spin group, I started the second bobbin. So that was why I was getting, I got really frustrated. I've been, like I said, I've been really tired and just feeling really, um, whatever this emotion is, that's how I've been feeling lately. Uh, the last few days and uh, last couple weeks and um, it for whatever reason I just absolutely could not get it started like it didn't matter what I did it just kept breaking and breaking and breaking and breaking and drifting apart and like I was just like mm -hmm. so thankfully virtual spin group bless their hearts they uh, definitely uh, got me through because I was just ready to rip my hair out literally but I've got it started now and I'm almost finished the second bobbin so that was that was really really lovely yeah, holy cow, you just started that. It's not that much fiber because it's only five grams per bobbin um, because this is a total of 20 grams. So I'm saving half of it for the workshop and then the other half becomes the the uh, the two-ply yarn that I'm spinning. So five grams, five grams for a total of 10 grams. So it's actually not that much fiber. Um, and actually, once I got going with it again, I was, I've actually been really enjoying it. So yeah. <laughs> Sam says, I found myself on a certain World of Wool website ordering Angora because of you. <laughs> and actually, if you guys participated in the last spin box from Sanjo Silk, uh, there was Angora included in that, um, in that box that was locally, locally grown and harvested um, from uh, little, well, they're not so little, from, from rabbits uh, locally. This is a total of 1.5 uh, ounces in each bag. So my plan, the reason why I pulled it out is actually to do a two ply for a total of a one ounce yarn. I think it works out to like 1.1 ounce. Um, and uh, so I've put it aside. I put one of the locks aside in my little Ziploc bag to preserve the fiber so that I know what I was spinning from. And I'll do one from each, um, one to each bobbin, one of these little bags. You can see how fluffy this is and just how how beautiful it is. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. And, uh, it's been, this has been cut, sheared off. I'll see if I can grab some out to show you, um, because there's the cut end. So you've got these, these, uh, locks, aren't they beautiful with that gorgeous gray and white? I mean, it's just going to make this amazing yarn. So I've been trying to figure out sort of what I'm going to do with it and how I'm going to spin it because 
I sort of, I was thinking about maybe carding it with my cotton cards and then I was sort of thinking about maybe combing it, but you know, to be honest with you, I kind of thought I would just spin it. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, it's just so beautiful. I mean, it, it just spins like it needs a ton of twist, but I mean, it's just such beautiful fiber, like to spin a fine downy twisted two ply that I could use long term for weaving. I mean, why not? So I was sort of thinking about just spinning it. Um, this kind of fiber needs a lot of twist. There's no scales, there's nothing to hold it together. So um, this is definitely um, something that you're gonna need a lot of twist. I am gonna spin it on my very fast fiber on the Lundrum. When I actually get it started, I'm not really sure. Um, Dorothy, you made me laugh. <laughs> uh, she says, we love you. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've put it in, uh, one of the locks into a baggie here because the this fiber because I have over an ounce of it I think I'm going to use it for my hand, hand weavers guild of America spinning certificate my certificate of excellence I've been slowly putting fibers aside to decide um, what I'm going to use and what might be an option and I think that this will be one of my other fibers uh, spin a down um, it's a short stapled or a long staple, but you know, to be honest with you, you could argue this either way that it's long or short, but I think that I'll use it for my long staple down. That's, um, not a wool or a silk fiber. That's a, that's a down for other fibers. So, um, I have it in my stash. I have the right amount. I think it's just kind of perfect, right? So I know there are some in our community, Kim is one of them who does a lot of this type of spinning, who sort of does a lot of like pet spinning, Shangora. And uh, I would love to hear from you what you would do with it. Would you, would you card it? Would you comb it? Uh, would you just spin it as is from the lock? That's completely an option. Uh, all right. So my X's and O's coasters. They're done, they're pressed, they're so pretty. <laughs> I just love them. Um, I do have some video of me um, weaving them, but how perfect are they in terms of size? Look at that. Isn't that perfect? It's like the perfect size. It's just awesome. So they're a little bit, like a little bit bigger than, you know, what you would get off of, say, the uh, pin loom. So this is a pin loom sample. So those are quite small. So when you put your, your tea or your coffee or your water, whatever you're drinking, like it, it definitely, you know, fills the entire um, thing. So these are a little bit bigger, a little bit more forgiving, but um, for a big mason jar, that's pretty good too, right? Because these, the I find if I put ice in them, of course they there's the condensation that gets all over everything. The reason why I chose the yellow for the 4-8 cotton for the warp is because it's actually what I had and I could not find the wh white 4-8 in my stash anywhere. I know that I have it, I just couldn't find it. I have since found it. But I thought that the yellow worked really well just to make, just to bring out the warmth in these. And if you see, like there's a little bit of gradation here in the colors from when Katrina had dyed it. This is the original yarn. And um, it has those hits of color in there. It's got that, that natural brown in there as well as the gray. Uh, and so it's, there's parts of the coasters where you can see that. And then all of these neps that she put in there as well as some of the sari silk is coming, coming through and it's got that very uh, rainbow-esque, um, those, that rainbow, those color colors and, and attributes and whatnot. So, um, you can see that throughout, throughout the coasters when I hold them up close, like you can really see the texture. You can see all of the Kemp, all of that white stuff. This is all Kemp. And some of the, uh, naps aren't staying in that they're sort of fall. Some of them are falling out. They're just not locked in. So over time, this Kemp is going to fall out and it's going to come, come out. Um, and if I sat there and pulled it out myself, I could probably get most of it out my, uh, on my own. But uh, yeah, for sure, that's you know just something to be aware of is that there is all of that Kemp uh, that's sort of there and present, and it, it's just the nature of that Herdwick. Um, that's what the the wool is. The contrast color, the the creamy. This is called cornflower. I think it was the colorway cornflower. It was. Uh, comb top from Luet. It wasn't very good quality. It was included in my um, 
in with my wheel, my, my Kromsky Menstrual when I got it. And I spun it up hoping for a slightly finer wool and it just uh it just would not spin particularly finely even though i stripped it down i pre-drafted it i did all the things um but regardless i ended up with sort of a worsted weight yarn eight eight to nine wraps per inch the herdwick is sort of eight to nine wraps per inch on average there are areas where it was a bit thinner when i spun it and a, a little bit thicker i suspect that just has to do with the the nature of the fiber there was that sari silk in there that those naps and oils um, but together they actually worked out quite well. The yarns are a little bit finer than what was called for in the pattern. Um, in the pattern she called for, um, in the pattern she called for um, Aran weight low P. And this is kind of more like a worsted weight, but I set, I still set it at eight ends per inch per the pattern um, with the four eight cotton. And um, I think that, I would like to make these again, and I think what I will do with the next set, um, with the yarns that's sitting here that are that that are the navy blue and the other one, um, I see your guys' questions. I will absolutely um, answer them in just a moment. Um, I think I'll set the coaster, the, the warp yarn, um, since this is a weft-faced fabric, so you only see the weft, you're completely covering the warp. I think I'll set it a little bit closer. So this was set at eight ends, I think I'll set it at six ends. It just needed to be a little bit closer, maybe even seven ends uh, per inch instead of eight ends per inch. I think I just needed it like for the, for because the, the other yarn is a little bit finer, so it just needs to be like a little teeny tiny bit closer than this, was set at so that's the only thing and that would take them down from about 4.75 inches on the loom down to about um down to about probably like four and a half inches square on the loom versus 4.75 on the loom square square and then the other thing is the hem stitching so the hem stitching at the top there because you're uh, hem stitching four threads together for each one your hem stitching is it's not particularly tight so in um sorry eve i meant 10 so going from eight up to 10 ends per inch thank you for catching that uh not more open at seven or six but more closed at nine or ten sorry thank you so much for pointing that out eve um for the hem stitching, Jane Stafford talks about in the denting scarf episode, which I think is season three, episode one. I think you guys might rem might I think I think it was that. Um, she talks about when you're hem stitching, doing an extra wrap before you go to the next um, batch of of threads that you're going to stitch together. So if you do your hem stitch and then um, you bring your yarn around and under the next set of stitches, instead of going under those next set of threads, sorry, I keep saying stitches, but I mean threads. Instead of going under the next set of threads, if you just wrap it one more time and then go under the next set of threads, I, I think that would have worked really, really well for this because otherwise the threads, uh, it just ends up being a little bit loosey, a little bit loosey goosey on the back. It's just not quite tight enough. Um, it's fine. It's structurally stable. It's not going to come undone. We're not going to be hard on these. They're going to be sitting on tables. Like, it's not a big deal. But I think I'll try next time just doing that extra wrap and just see if I can get that a little tiny bit, just a little bit snugger. However, I might not need to if I set them a little bit closer. But I will, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. This video is sped up to one and a half times. So just so that you guys know, I am not weaving like the wind. Table looms are not quick anyways. Um, I did speed it up to one and a half times just because otherwise it's a wee bit slow and we probably wouldn't be able to watch the whole thing and watch as the next segment. So I'm just finishing up the O's here and then it's gonna build up the X's next. So it's kind of fun to see the X's build relatively quickly. And here on these ones, I am using the Herdwick as the background and the Romney is the 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 lighter color the Romney is the X's and O's so as you can see there are two different uh, motifs I did light on dark and then dark on light so you can see how they're reversed same pattern same weaving light and dark and actually this one 
has a mistake at the top. It was This was my very, very first one. It's funny that I would pick up this one. Um, you can see how I made a, a, tre a, a treadling error with the table loom. Is that a paddling error? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, here where it started with an X and I, and I, um, I switched it into an O because it goes O, X, O, X, O. But you can see where it ended, where I, I have a treadling error. So actually this was my very, very first one. And I realized it after I was finished the complete, I started, it started off wrong. And I realized way up here that I've made a mistake. And I was like, doesn't matter. It's the first one, doesn't matter. <laughs> So there were some questions. So let me just go back and um, would they also work as pot pot plant mats? Uh, that is a tongue twister, Christine. So I am very leery now to put organic material, like not like organic fabric material, not organic materials, organic material under my plant pots. Because um, as you guys probably have figured out, I have an inordinate number of house plants. And I probably would have been a gardener if I wasn't a fiber person, uh, a, a maker. I absolutely love plants. They are all over our house. But a lot of my plants are in clay pots, like this one in behind us that I, I salvaged from the sidewalk that when somebody had thrown it out and it was a perfectly good pot. And I saved that piece lily from death. Um, and the problem is, is that like if you put plastic um, pot holders underneath to catch the water or if you're doing like African violets where you're watering them from the bottom um, and they're sucking the water up into their pot um, you're probably going to be fine to put something like this underneath however I have had some horror stories with putting stuff like this under my plants and I think it's just the moisture and uh, with clay pots and clay saucers they do uh, water goes in in and out of them they're moist um, I like this one back here I have a clear pot um, plate that the pot sits in but um, I lifted up one of my plants that was sitting in a plastic plate uh, and it must have had like a microscopic crack in it or something. And when I lifted it up off of one of the tea towel ends that I had put it on, because it was really pretty, it was like four or five inches of weaving, it was just perfect for that place, it was just the perfect accent. I lifted it up and the whole fabric underneath was completely disintegrated. Like it had, it had completely um, uh, composted down and broken down. I mean, it was organic cotton, of course it was going to decompose, but it decomposed in the space of a few months. So I'm very leery now to put stuff like this under my pots. However, for a hot mat under a teapot, this would be perfect. <laughs> and you could just weave them bigger. So you could just adjust the pattern, add a couple of repeats and make it longer, make the warp wider, and you would have the best place mats and, tea and teapot holders, hot mats, like they, they'd just be perfect because they're really thick. They're, um, the, these are not, they're not skinny. They're, they're, they're a good hefty fabric for sure. So, uh, what other questions? Uh, did, did, how did you finish the coasters once you were done weaving them? Great question, Dorothy. So, uh, and will they felt with use? Great questions. Okay. So what I did was I had the big long length of all of my, uh, coasters. I didn't cut them apart right away. Uh, per the instructions in the, um, uh, downloadable pattern, which is Amanda Rattage X's and O's coasters. It's right here. Just type it into Google. It's in the show notes. Um, I, she said to just wash, wash them in, um, warm water with a bit of soap and detergent, rinse them, hang them to dry. So what I ended up doing with all of my knowledge that I've kind of accumulated from unit one and all of the washing and the fulling that we did and all the experimenting that we did. And it was just hours and hours and hours of work. I knew that the Herdwick and the Romney are not going to readily felt in a fabric like this that is so stable. Um, they're just, it's not going to create something that looks like fleece. It's just, it's just not like, like not fleece like off of a sheet, but fleece like what I'm wearing here in the video. Like that's just one piece. And if it did ever so slightly, all that would do would add to the stability of the fabric. 
So what I did was I used quite warm water. I used detergent because I did find um, like it's just nice to get this stuff really, really super clean, get any oils off, any spinning oils, any um, anything left over from the manufacturing with the cotton. I did not use eucalyptus or soak or anything. I used detergent, like like laundry detergent, just a little bit, about a teaspoon. And I swished it around in the water and really like washed them. And then I rinsed them and I actually spun them in the dryer on a very low tumble dry. I timed it. It was about 10 minutes in total because I interrupted it a couple of times. And the finished fabric is just perfect. Um, it's, it's definitely nicely congruent um, um, it feels very even it's not going to come apart and then I ironed them with a hot iron on the cotton setting to get them to really lay flat so I was pretty aggressive with them and they came through with no no problem um <laughs> Vicky you're so funny I hope this isn't too personal but can we see the underside of the coasters <laughs> can you see their bums uh this is the top and this is the bottom. So it's a reverse. So they go on the right side, they go O X O X O. And on the reverse, that's the opposite. It's X O X O X. And if you let your eyes go blurry for a minute, if you kind of lose your focus, if you let your eyes go blurry, you can see the alternative pattern under there. You can see the O's and you can see the X's. Let me use a pencil. I feel like a teacher now. You can see the O's in between the X's and you can see the X's in between the O's. So just let your eyes go blurry and you can see the pattern there. So we would expect on the bottom, on the on the reverse side, that was the reverse side, um, the opposite. That we, if you're seeing an X on the top, you're gonna see an O on the bottom, which is exactly what we see. So on the bottom, it's X, O, X, O, X. Isn't that cool? And actually on the dark ones, it's even easier to see. So this is the right side of the dark ones. You can see that O, X, O, X, O. And then on the bottom, you can see the reverse. X, O, X, O, X. Okay, let me catch up with the questions. You guys have some really good questions today. You're very active. Um, teapot mats, I need some of those. Awesome, Allie, get weaving. <laughs> um, Eve says, I killed a cactus, so I gave up on keeping houseplants. Cacti are actually surprisingly difficult. Um, most people overwater them, and um, they don't live in homes that have enough humidity. Um, it's really interesting. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not that easy. My mom killed three of our cacti when we were away in August because she overwatered them. And my mom has tons of houseplants herself, like she knows. But it's just, just too much moisture. All right. Um... <laughs> Sam's Googling again. She's on more websites. And uh, Sam says, I've just been on Amanda Rataj's website, dot, dot, dot. Uh, when you go to buy the XO pattern, look at the free overshot towels pattern as well. So that's on Amanda's website as well. So definitely, yeah, definitely, Charlotte. Good, uh, good um, pointing, uh, um, highlighting, because that's, that's just great and something to, uh, to watch. Okay. Let's, I will see you guys on the other side and let's go do community participation because it is getting quite late and I have to go get the kids. So I was sitting here looking at all the names and thinking, oh my goodness, we have so many people to highlight and to celebrate. A couple of them are here today. And I also thought I better drink something to lubricate my throat to keep my voice working. I find that's when I lose my voice is when I don't actually keep drinking and making sure that um, I have lots of liquid because um, it's a lot of talking. I know anybody who uh, has uh, does their own podcasting and does their own um, um, stuff where you're talking all day and you're in meetings and whatnot. Like you know, it's it's hard on your voice for sure. Ah, that's so funny, Eve. She says this may be weird, but I love hearing you type. Uh, it's it it yeah. I I know I know what you mean. I like the um, 
the flurry of like in movies and stuff when there's like a newsroom and you can hear all of the like commotion of typing and all the things. I, I like that. Uh, I like that as well. There's something to that. So breed and color studies and Dorothy says that Eve is a weirdo. So there you go. <laughs> Two sides of the coin. <laughs> I love it. They're also best friends. So um, they're not insulting each other just for those who are watching. Uh, breed and color study. We did Jacob uh, back in the summer and then, uh, sorry, and into the fall. That was from July until December of 2021. And we did Shetland before that. So that was January through to June. And then we went into the, into the Jacob study. So this is from Becca. These are both of her studies. So her Shetland study and then the photo afterwards is her Jacob study. So um, she's been catching up and, and realized that she hadn't, that she'd finished the spin ages ago, but didn't post anything. So here's the Shetland breeding color study yarns. I wanted to try having the base colors shift slowly through the skeins. So I made 10 mini skeins of three ply and moved one single at a time from three singles on the white base through gray and then brown. The 10th skein is one ply from each base. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a great idea? And you can see how in the top there, there's the lightest skein. And then it of course moves down and around to the darkest skein. So that's really cool. What a great idea, Becca. That's gonna knit into something really, really fun. And then the second part of this is her breeding color study from Jacob. Uh, so posting another breeding color, breeding color study yarn, the Jacob this time, which will make me look terribly productive. However, these were actually done ages apart. Uh, no real color management here. I just spun the singles for practice and for a quick squishy yarn, but I can tell that I was slightly rushed and or stressed as they have a bit more twist than planned, which, which increased from skein to skein. Uh, roughly sport weight and now just thinking about what I, how I want to combine them. So this is really incredible. If you guys look at Becca's yarn here, um, I know it keeps cycling between the two photos, but look at her singles yarn and really take a moment to uh, note how evenly spun this is that the uh, in the skeins um, they lay together and they um, uh, sort of pair in the singles in parallel to one one another um, sort of kink and curl at the same points all the way around the skein that is done when you spin unbelievably consistently. So her rate of twist and her treadling and her drafting, because I'm pretty sure that she did these on her um, flat iron, um, was very, very even. It's just beautiful, Becca. Just lovely, lovely spinning. And even if they are a little bit higher twist, to be honest with you, I love singles that look like this and I think they're just incredible. In incroyable. This is spindle spun stitches. This is from Lindsay. This is so much fun. Um, spindle spun stitches is sort of an ongoing celebration of spindle spun yarns. And uh, she had some, she's had drop spindles for ages, but never really used them once I got my wheel. I would get frustrated by them dropping if the fiber broke and the slowness of them. But I turned them around and instead of top whirl, they are now bottom whirl. And I took my time. I have just spun a 100 gram 100 grams of white Welsh mountain fiber, plied it on my spindle and have every intention of getting it onto the needles pronto. My photo is of the single cop when I'd taken it off the whirl. It's so pretty. Yes, yes it is. It's absolutely gorgeous, Lindsay. Really well done. Beautiful. And once again, look at how consistently spun that is. It's just beautiful. I'm just catching up with the with the chat. Um, yes, so Becca says thanks, guys. Yep, all on the flat iron. It's been good practice. That's awesome. I can actually. I I'm getting to the point where with um, Becca's one of our original community members, and I've known her forever. Um, she uh, I can tell which yarns she spindle spun and which yarns she did on the wheel. They they have a they have a certain look. And so I'm sort of starting to like know which, which yarn she wheel spun and which one she uh, spindle spun. It's kind of funny. This is from Kim. Um, this is for our natural shades along. So this is just celebrating all fibers that are natural shades. Um, this is her poodle hair spin done. Amazing. That's a lot of yarn. <laughs> That's a lot of yarn. So well done. It still gives me the heebie-jeebies, but 
I'm, I can celebrate others. <laughs> this is from Megan. This is actually a question. So Megan has this great question. I spun these yarns all at the same time using the same process for all, hoping I would make myself a sweater with the end results. The question, question, did I somehow add too much twist to the top skein? These have all been washed and I'm hoping that I can put the top skein back through my spinning wheel to make it less twisty. So I actually took her original photo, which is this one, and I cropped it and took a picture of the upper corner so that you could see what was going on. So this is not um, a case of too much twist. This is a case of actually having plied in the wrong direction. So um, her other skein is all balanced. It it's, looks wonderful. Um, it's laying flat. The, the, the twist is balanced, um, but she's actually plied it in the wrong direction. So what you need to do, Megan, is um, either uh, put it on a skein winder or a swift, or I would recommend winding it into a center pull ball and you need to put it back through the wheel, but you need to ply it in the right direction. So what you're gonna have to do is untwist the twist that's in there and then re-twist it to ply it in the right direction. And then you'll be off to the races. So when you go, it's gonna take a while. It does take a while. Um, <laughs> ask me how I know, um, but uh, take the time to make sure that you have adequate amount of twist going in the correct direction. Because what has happened to me in the past is I untwist the yarn because it's basically been up plied. So I, um, you untwist the yarn, but make sure you're watching that twist angle of your once you get it going in the right direction and you ply it in the right direction um, because it's uh, you, you're already spending all that time treadling to get all that twist that's in there from the wrong direction out, that it's natural not to put enough ply twist in. So have it, have your other yarn sitting right there or your ply back sample or something that's right there that you can uh, check it against to make sure that you're putting enough twist in. So yes, yep, you called it Eve. Megan plied in the, in the she plied, she, what, what she did actually was she plied her yarn in the same direction that the singles were spun. So if you were making a hauser yarn, that is exactly what you do. Um, it, with a hauser yarn, you spin your singles and then you uh, up ply them. Um, you basically take two of your singles, you, you spin four singles, not eight, four, four singles in the same direction and then you take two of them and you up ply them in that same direction that you spun your singles and you take your other two singles and you do the same thing again so you have two two ply yarns that are up plied up twisted in the same direction and then you take those two two ply yarns that are that look just like this sorry cameras over here uh that look just like this and then you ply them together in the opposing direction in in the so you you spin single z you up ply to z and then you ply them s so this is a thing it's just that megan wasn't going for that thing here <laughs> this is how i learned what plying in the wrong direction does yes dion absolutely amanda says as a new spinner thanks to megan for sharing that pic so that i can see what it looks like yes um, this is why we need to celebrate our, um, our oopses because then we can learn. So sometimes I'll do it twice, says Jennifer, one to untwist and two to correctly twist. That is a great idea, Jennifer. That's excellent because if you do it through once to untwist it and then take that bobbin off, put it on your lazy Kate and then go and then put it back through to ply it, then you're breaking it apart and you're making sure that you're getting enough ply twist in there. That's a great idea, Jennifer. All right, this next one is from Vicky. This is under sample spinning and play. So this is just uh, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. That's from Carl Jung. This is from Vicky. Oh my goodness, the squish factor. I had this spun up almost immediately after I got it and I applied it too. But then it just became dining room art, hanging off a chair, winking at me occasionally. Vicky, I love your posts. I love reading them. I finally took it off and found the stats. Mystery wool bat from Zia Wools, I think. Uh, 142 yards, 108 grams, 596 yards per pound, seven to nine wraps per inch. Sometimes bigger than seven wraps per inch. It's an overall thick and thin yarn and about 15% elasticity, eight bumps per inch. It's beautiful. This is gonna be so much fun to play with Vicky. 
This is from Dion. This was, uh, okay, only you all could appreciate this. Absolutely. I'm so excited about how my Wolfine to Advent calendar is knitting up. The first pick is how I mixed um, almost all the... The first pick is how I mixed almost all of the days, and the second is my swatch. I'm loving it so much and glad I took picks because this totally works for me when I'm combo spinning. It's beautiful. So much fun. Thank you for sharing, Dion. I can't wait to see what you make out of this yarn. This is from Janine. Unwashed and still full of energy. I'll give a yardage count after washing, but we leave for vacation on Thursday and I'm just trying to clear bobbins because driving from New Hampshire to Florida means that she's taking the ladybug on a cruise. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So happy cruising, Janine. This is from Sue, more travel. Uh, camp spinning is always satisfying. Polworth and Coriadale scoured fleece, hand combs and mini spinner. I look forward to doing a bit if I can every afternoon while we're on the road. Isn't that beautiful spinning? Amazing. And I love her battery pack there, it's huge. I love that you guys name your wheels. I used to, it's so funny, but I, 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 I just haven't. Um, after my first wheel uh, and after I sold it, I never named another wheel after that. This is from Priscilla talking about the Lunenburg pullover. Priscilla finished hers this week. Yay. It's beautiful. Congratulations, Priscilla. It just looks awesome on you. This is from Sam. I have completed another of my 51 yarns recently, number 35 to be precise, spin a yarn from silk fiber. I chose to spin up some silk mawatas that I bought on Etsy some time ago. Following Rachel's recent video, I set to work. I am so pleased with the finished results. Three hankies split apart, then randomly spun to two bobbins and plied. The total of the hankies was about 10 grams, spun short forward, 60 uh, twist per inch, 45 wraps per inch, twist angle between 35 and 40 degrees with a result of 110 yards and a grist of 4,900 yards per pound. That's pretty awesome. That's silk for you. I really enjoyed the process and my hands have never had so much pampering with a salt scrub and moisturizer before each spin. Thank you to me. <laughs> Uh, Welford Pearls for your tuition, tu tuition and encouragement. I hope to get some more Moatas from Wonder Wool next month. I wish I was going to Wonder Wool. It's down in Wales. I wish I was going. That would be so great. And this is from Kathy for weaving another shawl off my table loom. The next warp will go on my new to me floor loom. This one is 100% hand spun. Kathy, what kind of loom did you get? I saw your comment earlier in the chat about a new loom, but what did you end up getting? The white stripes are silk from the Sanjo sample box last spring and the warp is pulver silk. The weft is merino tensile. The colorway is a one of a kind cherry blossom from Greenway Fiberworks and it makes me feel like spring. Yes, does it ever. And I think this is, is this Huck maybe? I'm not exactly sure. I don't think you said in your post, but I think it's Huck or maybe it's Bronson Lace. I'm not totally sure. Hopefully, I don't know if Kathy's still here, but maybe she'll chime in and let us know. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing all of your amazing work and all of your amazing things that you guys are always making. It's so inspirational. Um, I wanted to say one quick thing about the X's and O's coasters, because we talked about them for quite a while there, and I, I don't want to uh, go back over them again and again and again, but um, one of the things that I did want to mention, I was weaving these on my table loom on my my Louette Jane uh, which I have the 15 inch one is that the right measurement Dorothy you and I have the same one is it 15 inches wide or 15.5 inches wide I know it's only 0.5 of an inch but I can never remember anyhow um I wanted to mention really briefly that was a perfect loom uh, to put these on because I'll, for a couple of reasons um, the first reason is because the warp is not very long I think the warp that she calls for in the pattern is only like 1.4 or 1.6 yards long I think I made mine a little tiny bit longer like 1.7 yards long just because that's how it worked out on my on my on my warping uh, board but um, 
even if you make a longer warp and you put a longer warp on, you're going to have a certain amount of waste at the front and the back. So uh, a table loom is great because it, it does minimize some of the waste. And uh, I was able to weave almost to the back of the warp. I think I only had about six or eight inches left at the back end. Same with the front end, I only lost about four inches of the front end warp. So overall, it was just a really good use of space in terms of, of using my, my Jane. I know the Spring and the David don't have a lot of loom waste either, um, but not everybody has a Louette or a, a Louette David or, or a Louette Spring sitting in their living room. So um, definitely uh, something to think about. The, the table loom was perfect. The other thing is that as you're building your O's and as you're building your X's, you have to figure out sort of how hard to beat to get a nice circle. Um, and so it did take the first, probably the first uh, coaster and a half to really figure out sort of how much to pack down the weft. And um, if your weft is too thin and it's got too much air and it's it's too springy of a yarn, um, it's going to pack down really super tightly and it's going to be difficult to get those nice circles and to get that nice that nice X. And then lastly, your lifting pattern is a little bit more difficult. So if you've got, um, uh, if you're doing a, a floor loom and you're treadling, um, you need to know exactly what is tied up to what. Um, and so I did find that the direct tie up was really nice because I knew if I had to raise one and three, I could just raise one and three, um, you know, two, three, three, four, and you start to be able to kind of predict where your floats need to go, your weft picks, where they need to go to build the shapes. So having that direct tie up was really great because you could, I could kind of start to read like where was I going next, um, which is how I realized after that other one, I realized right away after I had done the hem stitching, once I kind of sat back a little bit and looked at the whole coaster, I could see right away that, that this, that I had made that treadling error at the beginning. It was down at the bottom. Um, and then after that, you could kind of see how, how things needed to go and where the pattern, the weft pattern picks needed to go to create the pattern. So if, if my, uh, what happened a couple of times was my X in the middle, there's two or three picks here in the middle of the X to create that, that cross um, here. And there was a couple of times where I had the wrong, uh, threads lifted and um, I could see right away that I had lifted like one and three instead of two and three because of where things were lining up. So it's just a really great visual for those who are still learning about the structure of fabric and how our warp and weft picks work and, and how the ends work and what's active and what's not active and what needs to go where. Um, it's a really great lear learning tool. So if you do have a table loom for some of these smaller projects, I would highly recommend, even though it's a little bit slower, um, than, than treadling with your feet. It was a really great way of learning how the different uh, units worked. Um, you know, if I lift these two threads, what, what's going where and what's active and what's happening? Uh, it's just really, really helpful. So I hope that that's helpful. 15.75 inches. Thank you so much, Dorothy. I knew it was like right in there. So that's wonderful. Thank you to everybody for being here today. I really appreciate your time, your energy, your attention. And uh, as always, thank you to those who are part of the Patreon community. You guys are, are so special. Thank you so, so, so much. And uh, I think I will see you this time next week. I did want to mention really briefly, um, we have spring break starting on Monday. And normally I would take one of the two weeks off of the live stream, just to give myself a bit of a break, give, give me something to uh, catch up a little bit um, and just a little bit of breathing room. So we will have a live stream next week, regular scheduled time, all of the all of the stars aligning. And then the week after on the 22nd, we'll skip a week and I'll, I'm gonna take the week off. The other reason is Nora's having surgery on the Monday, the day before. I'm not totally sure what that's gonna look like for her in terms of recovery. Um, so I, I would like the Tuesday to just be focused on, on the kids and on her. So thank you for understanding. Um, that was sort of a pre-COVID thing, like a pre-pandemic thing that I would always take a week at, at spring break. And then we got out of the habit because of, because of the pandemic. So I know that you guys really understand. So thank you. Thank you. And then we'll be back to regular scheduled programming on the 29th because March is a long month. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you guys same time, same place next weekend or no next Tuesday. Bye everyone.